Okay, here we go. And we're both recording now, I believe. Okay. Let's see, your record uh, icon has not come up yet. There it is. Hey, everything's going good. Here we are. Now we can present ourselves, you know, to the to the public, and uh, by way of your uh, YouTube channel, which is Pantherism, and I think that it's important to uh, explain what that's all about, you know, from a personal point of view. So I'd like to ask you, Steve Struggle, how it came about that you've uh, you became who you are. Uh, well, well, let's just say that, you know, the social struggles in the period um, impacted me on an intellectual and personal level. And um, I was convinced at a very young age that the capitalist system was bankrupt, was not worthy of continuing or these, it wasn't worthy of my support for it or engagement with it or defending it. So from that position, um, from that time with the different wars of aggression that France and the United States uh, with allies from South Korea and other parts of the world were engaging in the third world. Um, I just figured that it was okay for me to join that movement and not be part of the pro-America, pro-capitalist movement. And that's kind of how it all evolved. What happened in high school? High school was just high school, which is high school. You know, I know that um, there were newsletters that radical students on the ground campus the campus newspaper was controlled by the administration, so you couldn't put out, you couldn't put out, put out any anti-imperialist, pro-socialist, or pro-communist materials on campus. So there were more. There were just anti anti-imperialist or anti-racist uh, or organizers on campus who affiliated the different organizations, and you know that's kind of what high school was about. Just trying to get through high school, but also. Uh, maintaining an anti-imperialist perspective, developing it really, um, leaving school and visiting organizations and people who were activists within the region. Mm -hmm. like were the organizers at the high school, were they also students there? Yeah, the ones at the high school were all students, yes. They were all students, yeah. What kind, of, what kind of attendances uh, did, uh, made their impact on you or were attractive to you? What were the uh, newsletters that were being put out? Well, some were um, some were from uh, Marxist humanists, uh, Raya Danielskaya's group. Some were Black liberationist. Uh, some were um, kind of yippie-ish fellows of Jerry Rubin and um, still this book approach to life. So, and um, some were more um, I would say just hippie-ish. Uh, uh, anarchist, anti, just clearly an, an anti-establishment with no real view of what, no conservative view of what the correct way of life was, but the, opposing the current way of life. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, what would you uh, advise, you know, uh, high school students uh, who want to organize their place? What should they be doing? Well, what I think they should, I think they should go as left as possible in their views that they can understand or appreciate. Let's not consolidate with the Republic, with the Democratic Party or people who are, want to be with the Democrats. That's not going to work. Yeah. Even though there are a lot of people are connected with this. Um, there are different anti... There are different movements I find in high school that focus on climate change. There seems to be a rallying cry. Uh, like a lot of high school students. Um, and I would call upon them to to begin to connect climate change to 
fossil fuel extraction and to the industries and the system that promotes it. Because the world system is based on is based on on based on fossil fuel extraction, and the current system will tell you that it's going to find a way to make it all right. But they're not going to make it right because their profits are based on fossil fuel extraction, or or even if they're able to go to solar, it's all going to be about them making profits. So profits and the capitalist system is 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 their game. And our, ha our focus has to be anti-capitalist and anti-profit. And while there are a lot of good people who are um, good I mean, students who are focused on this issue, I encourage them to draw, connect the dots between the capitalist and imperialist systems, the banking, the military industrial complex, and the um, fossil fuel extraction uh, industries, because those are linked like like an umbilical cord to um, a fetus, and there's no connecting them. There's no, there's no dis disconnecting. Them. Yeah. So that's that's yeah. what I would say. Uh, I also would encourage high school students to form links with other high school students and students in, in community colleges because they are eventually going to leave high school. So they have to find links with other people who are outside of high school right now. So when they leave high school, they still have connections. So they should have connections with, uh, with other high school students using WhatsApp um, and other kind of uh, encrypted media sources so that the administration at the schools can't be aware of what they're doing. The administration mm -hmm. schools wants to quash any protests that are anti-fossil fuel extraction. They, they really don't want it around, even though they may act like you have free speech, no. You have to assume that you don't have free speech. You have to assume that you need to learn encryption methods, use, use, um, use digital devices that can maintain your privacy. And you also have to connect with people and other high school students in this country, United States, in the region, the region being United States, Mexico, and Canada, and then globally. You have to do that so that you can see what other people are doing and learn from, their, learn from them. Because if, if you have an open mind, and learn from other students in high school and college, then you'll be able to expand your thinking, expand your movement. So mm -hmm. we have to work. Mm -hmm. That would certainly accelerate <laughs> things. Yeah, it, would. it definitely would. Yeah. 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 Um, there's, uh, you know, you refer to, uh, you know, freedom of speech. You know, there's uh, other uh, rights that high school students, you know, can claim, uh, as I did when I was in high school. You know, there's a freedom of speech, there's freedom of of uh, ex of ex expression, like in a demonstration, and then there's freedom of association. So, right, right. what we insisted upon in high school is that we we had a, a, a group of about eight, and we set up a student club inside the school system, so we could use the school system's facilities, and so that we could have uh, open access. To the students as well. We even had a Vietnam teaching inside this, the high school right. with, with the help of the teachers. So uh, that's uh, another sort of, you know, uh, organizational platform on which to uh, bring forward the uh, program that you've been talking about, because yes, that's you know, what concerns the most. Right. I agree. Yeah. I agree. How did... Uh, how did uh, the uh, anti-war movement impact you? What kind of uh, organizational format were you involved in? Well, the, the anti-war movement had, had, there were mixed, well, the anti-war movement to me is very important. Be it the war in Iraq, the war in Vietnam, the wars against uh, Grenada, the war against Panama, all of the, um, the militarist uh, adventures of, of conquest and domination by the US, military state have all had a impact on me that made that galvanized my thinking against the system. There's nothing that has occurred that the military does that is correct, just not not brutal anything. And that's been shown by its history. So the whole, even even the persecution of Julian Assange, Chelsea Manning, mm -hmm. all those, all those actions are against the military. Those are all anti-military actions by citizen journalists, activists, and forces who want a better world, you know, broadly a better world without, without military aggression and domination. So 
it's had a central impact on me. And I, I think that um, uh, that's one thing that really, that, uh, those, those, that situation, uh, police terror, um, the genocide against, against liberation movements and, and, and revolutionary tendencies, those have all shown me that the system stinks and you, you basically, it can't, it can't, if it's reform, it's just to make sure it, it's reform, so it's reform, so it has a different smell. It still stinks, even, 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 even with the reform. Yeah. Military mm -hmm. reform. Yeah. It can't mm -hmm. be reform. It's not, it's not that we just hate it because it's, it's not that you hate it because of its armed forces. No, it can't be reform again. It, it is the armed wing of, of, of the imperialist system. That's who they send to do the most dirty of work, the most, the most, um, the most, the work that, that is designed to inflict collateral damage on infrastructure, on peoples, on civilizations. There's nothing just about it. Absolutely nothing just about it at all. So the anti-war mm -hmm. movement, even though many of them were organized around peace and withdrawal and slogans that literally, I wouldn't say they're meaningless, but literally don't have the tooth that I would want them to have, uh, the anti-war movement was very important in that it, it focused on opposing U.S. aggression and Western aggression around the world. Yes, mm -hmm. an anti-imperialist movement, in other words. Yes. Right. Yeah, we had a division in the anti-war movement in Toronto. I think it was elsewhere as well. There was a difference between what was called the peace movement and the anti-war movement, on the other hand. Right. Okay. Right. And the peace movement, you know, was, uh, you know, the liberal, oh. radical, radical liberals, you know, Christian, uh, Christian uh, liberationists, and the Communist Party, basically. And they had, you know, 20,000 people mobilized in Toronto. And then, you know, in the anti-war movement that we organized, including, you know, the high school movement, the Students Against the War in Vietnam, SOV, was, uh, you know, 20,000 as well. <laughs> and then we met in the middle of the city, you know, and then uh, it was quite impressive. We tried to take the uh, main right. street, but they, they brought out the horses against us. And I got stomped on by a horse's hoof on that day, I remember. Wow. Yeah. yeah. But uh, it was, uh, you know, like it certainly helped to bring about an end to the war in Vietnam. But it was mainly the resistance that uh, brought about the end to the war in Vietnam under General Phan, who on the uh, third offensive, you know, was able to actually drive physically the um, US military forces out of Vietnam, an incredible accomplishment on the part of Vietnam. Yes, well, I mean, I, I think that that those those victories should be celebrated around the world, and I know that sounds quote anti-American, but mm -hmm. we shouldn't have been there. Mm -hmm. There's no business being there. You want to tell them nobody but yourself. So what? Why should I be? Why should I give you any any applause? If yeah. anything, I should give I should be giving you a middle finger. Okay, so I'm sorry. Yeah. Just, I'm yeah. I'm happy that they won. It's a, it's a great day. Whenever we leave, it's a great day. Yeah. Whenever the U.S. leaves the country, it's a great day for the world because the U.S. has no business being there. Yeah. For anybody else, France, Germany, Japan, whoever, they all need to go because yeah. there's this occupying people's places. It's not cool. Yeah, that's been demonstrated against now in uh, Afghanistan, of course. Similar right. situation. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the recent trove of documents that most people have not even had a chance to read because they have to pay a dollar to read the New York Times or whatever. It's not free about Afghanistan, it's appalling. The murders, the destruction, the rape, the torture. Iraq was just a testing ground. Mm -hmm. Afghanistan was full-fledged um, uh, you know, military assault against the population. Yeah. And now the Taliban don't have their money, the US takes their money. What yeah. the hell is this a what? What is all this about? Uh, this is their money, you were giving them. Yeah. I mean, I assume it's their money. If not, what's wrong with giving us some money? You want to give everybody else some money? Yeah. Want to give, you know, you're tearing the country up. Even on the basis of humanitarian, even on the basis of reparations for what you've done, you owe them, we owe them some money, a whole lot of money for like the next hundred years or so. You yeah. know? Yeah. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's just appalling. And this isn't talked about too much by the, by the left movement. The sanctions, the sanctions, the anti sanctions movement. The, the rape and torture and pillage of Afghanistan, of Iraq, of the Middle East, the uh, murder of uh, General uh, Soleimani by the Trump administration. You can't just be killing people. 
Yeah. I mean, who says we can just kill people like this? Somebody yeah. says it must be right. And if, and if it, yeah, anyway, yeah. the anti-war, the anti-war movement has really helped me focus on why the imperialist system stinks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, um, and at the same time, you know, all these uh, Western uh, capitalist states complaining about the migrants who want to come in. And England even left the European Union because they didn't want to have the migrants coming in over the channel, you know. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah, and these, these migrants, these refugees, are refugees because of the wars that they started in the first place. <laughs> they don't make the connection at all. It's incredible, you know, how neurotic, you know, their, their uh, mentality is nurtured by television and the news right. media. Incredible. Even Al Jazeera is very disappointing, you know, oftentimes in how it adopts, you know, the Western narrative. And, you know, yes. on a world scale, you know, what we're seeing, I think you would agree, is that it's the, the Western capitalist countries that have invaded the Oriental resource rich countries. Basically, that's the scenario. And that's been going yeah. on yeah. since what, 2001? Okay. Well, wow. <laughs> yeah. Like, what is this, a permanent yeah. occupation? This is like the Crusades, so. you know, in the past, you know, yes, yes, Jerusalem yes. was a prize before, yes. now it's oil that's the prize, <laughs> right, but the right, same methodology, right. yeah, yeah. So it's not surprising that you know, we see uh, jihadist uh, groups uh, popping up of various kinds. The uh, yeah, Taliban are jihadists, but they're not, you know, uh, jihadists in a, in a terrorist sense and not jihadists in an international sense either, it would seem, because they're just, you know, more of a national liberation movement than anything else. Then they're not really a revolutionary movement otherwise. Right. And I, I think that's, that's, and I think that's, I think that activists should learn from what you just said. The Taliban aren't revolutionary. They simply want the U.S. to occupy us out, out, out of their country. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what can you say to that? Well, you're right. I don't dig where you're coming from, but you're right. Yeah. I, I mean, you're right. I can't. Can't can't fall at you on that one. Nope. Yeah. 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 Well, they're admirable in that they've unified civil society and uh and overcome any sort of you know civil war that might have arisen, you know, with the withdrawal of US troops. So they have a, a totally, you know, like uh you know, cohesive society, coherent society, but they're not taking on you know the sources of wealth in society either to alleviate the poverty and all that. They don't even think they have a right to do so, it would seem, you know, they're really naive anyway. So the anti-war movement, did it sort of a, was it a factor in insp inspiring the development of the uh, Black Revolutionary Movement and the Black Panther Party in particular? Well, there was, you know, other formations before that, SNCC, et cetera, but as a mass phenomena, you know, it- well, I, I really think that, um, I really think we need to unearth more about SNCC's anti-war work because I don't think it's really known that well and I don't want to say it wasn't it wasn't um exhausted because I don't know a lot about it but I know there were some good people in SNCC who when I went in into the black liberation movement and I know SNCC was against the war in Vietnam um I know that the anti-war movement definitely had an influence on Black Panthers on groups like subsequent groups like the all African People's Revolutionary Party that Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael led. That's one of the things that I think um, I also, um, I, I would think League of Revolutionary Black Workers based in Detroit, I would think that most left of center Black organizations were forced to rethink some of the narrow patriotism like I served in the army that is present within of the black nation. Uh, either people who were recruited, who were, who were drafted, or who may have joined the volunteer army after, after the draft ended. So you have these guys like, like Colin Powell was nothing but a killer. However, within some just in the black community, he's given laud, lauded because of his service to his country. So I think that these quote service to his country and the fact he rose to a high position within the military industrial complex. Um, so I definitely think the anti-war movement had a left, pushed many 
people to the left in their thinking. I think it was a good thing. Um, yeah, I think it was. And to this day, to this day, those revolutionary ten, those revolutionary sentiments do distinguish um, civil rights activism with anti-imperialist activism. It does distinguish those tendencies. I, I don't know how they're being played out in Black Lives Matter. I would like to know. I wish they could, I wish they were doing much more on their focus, but I'm not sure what they're doing right now. But I, I do think that movement was very was very, very, very positive. Um it caused solidarity with the revolution in Algeria, revolution in uh Vietnam, revolutions, revolutions in uh Angola, Mozambique, Guinea Bissau, Cape Verde. South Africa, uh, Grenada, opposition to U.S. Dom bombing of Panama, um, th these things. So it definitely had a positive impact. Mm. Uh, currently, uh, what do you think is the most important revolutionary process underway? I, I'm thinking of Yemen. You no, know, I need I need to learn more about the Houthi movement in general. But in general, I think. I mean, I think Yemen is a clear example of how, well, I, I can say a lot about the Yemen struggle, and I tend to not want to get, present what I would consider anti-Islamic statements at the end of my narrative, but, you know, Saudi Arabia, the Muslim people, I have to wonder, I mean, yeah. what's going on with this, with this? I mean, this is not any way brotherly. Just on the issue of just the religion itself, it presents itself as a religion of brotherhood. Okay, I'm you know I'm not religious, but I I, I can go with that. So how is Saudi Arabia showing brotherhood here? Yeah. They're a terrible. Country. It's terrible. I mean, it's not even. It's, it's a monarchy. It's, it needs to go. So you have a monarchy imposing death and destruction on a neighboring small country that it wants to control and it can't win. It's not winning. Mm. It's not winning. It's just like U.S. and Afghanistan. Whatever issue issue people have with with uh, Asha al al Allah, the Houthis, as they call, mm. who can oppose? They're opposing the Saudi Arabia controlling the country. Mm. The United States is, is right there involved, and all the West is right there involved. Israel, uh, UAE, I heard is involved. You know, so mm. I think it's a very important fight in 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 Saudi Arabia. Um, I think that's an important fight. Uh, I also think the anti-sanctions movement, the anti-sanctions fight is very important, especially against countries like Cuba, Venezuela, uh, any other country in the world that U.S. has sanctions against, that's in the third world. To me, those are the centers of struggle because that's where the U.S. is actively involved in regime change using economic means. In Saudi Arabia, they're using military means. In Vietnam, the, in in and would have sanctions. They're using stealing people's money, stop them getting loans. I mean, this this is that's what's happening with Afghanistan. Same kind of thing. So, I think those we have the military in in Yemen, the economic the economic uh, hitman approach in other parts of the world. I like to see more pro, more emphasis given on this because this is where quote our government is engaged in mass murder. And inflicting longitudinal damage to a nation. Those nations didn't. Those nations didn't. Those those nations have a right to reparations from this government for what the, this government is doing to them. When that becomes a people's issue, in the United States. That's when you start having revolutionary change. That says that we, in the United States, say, oh, no, this is wrong. What what we are doing, and we want to end to it, and 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 and, and we and we want reparations. Given to these people, the man is coming from us, not from them. Yeah, you can't take somebody's money, man. It's just, I mean, I don't know if anybody's ever been sanctioned by a bank or by a government just to take start taking your money. Yeah. We ain't getting yeah. the net. Why? Because I say so. You know. Well, yeah. well there will be a a reckoning to come, as as one would yes, say. Yes, reckoning to come, reckoning to come, definitely, definitely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I have a friend of mine, a person I know, who went to Yemen recently to see their relatives. I was like, whoa. Hope you come back alive. I mean, he had to, he had, he had to say to somebody who's going somewhere, you know? 
what well, well, wasn't the COVID, people just get killed by by these these various factions that Saudi Arabia is supporting. They just just because they have they have murder on their minds. So it's a very dangerous situation, and I think it needs much more attention than it's getting. Yes, I don't think it's very well known in the American media. The Americans are not even aware that there's a war there. Not, not really. I mean, not really. Yeah. No, not really. You know, we not really. Yeah, no. Uh-huh. It's really strategic. You know, I, I can see why. You know, the Saudi Arabia, United States, etc., are so desperate. You know, to retain control over Yemen because Yemen, at, at, at either end, you know, controls the uh, the sea routes. You know, to most of the world's oil. <laughs> mm. You know, well, that's that's a, that's a very interesting uh, perspective we need to talk about more because yeah. it's not talked about, and this year is just starting. We need to make that a maybe an initiative we can do. We can take care of over the next 300, 300 and and sixty two days. We need mm-hmm. a little more, a little more on that. Yeah, and there are people here. There are people here from Yemen around the world who can give us firsthand information. Yeah, yeah, uh, and. Um, Probably, you know, the U.S. military industrial complex is complicit by uh, selling them the arms to, uh, to do the right. war. Yeah. Any, anybody selling them arms, anybody, the United States, Russia, China, any, uh, France, Israel, yeah. Israel's yeah. hands just, just. Israel it. selling drones, yeah. And, you know, Britain is selling uh, helicopters or whatever, you know, like. They have blood up to their necks, man. It's all, all uh, it's all, yeah. uh, you know, it's all complicit. Yeah. Right. Right. Now, right. Yemen, you know, if, if Yemen had control over the straits there, Strait of Hormuz and the, the Red Sea uh, uh, entry point there, that, you know, controls the Suez Canal, you know, which, you know, Nasser nationalized and which uh, provoked uh, the uh, uh, the triple alliance of uh, Britain, France and Israel, which attacked, you know, the Suez Canal and tried to overthrow Nasser, failed. And... Uh, Imagine, you know, the control, you know, the geopolitical power that this would, you know, present, you know, to the third world, because Yemen would be operating on, the, on behalf of the third world, in effect. So if the United States actually did attack China, as it's threatened to do, you know, the, any war the United States could start, you know, on a mass scale like that, could be stopped immediately, you know, by shutting down the oil routes, because the army only operates, you know, if there's oil around. You know, the United States has its own oil, but, you know, what are they going to do? You know, let everybody, you know, starve and freeze. Then they wouldn't last very long, you know. So the geopolitical uh, axis uh, point, turning point here around Yemen, I think, is very strategic. Yeah. And uh, and yet we're doing nothing about it so far. So, uh, you know, I'm concerned about that. Yeah, I I, I, I think so. I, I, I agree with you. And I look, I. I look forward to working with you to, you know, do some education and, and activism within this area. Very yeah. Important. Yeah. I think that there's a lot of, you know, like uh, committees around in everybody's area that uh, are part of the anti-war movement, you know, that are not, not ongoing, not in active, and, and they can be activated, you know, even with one person stepping inside and then, uh, right. you know, pushing it, pushing it out into the open again. Right. Right. Okay, so uh, are there other uh, initiatives underway in in your area or or in uh, that you're aware of in the United States? You know that you would like to promote. Well, I think we always need to be working to get our political prisoners out of jail. Oh yeah. Uh, I know that the Malcolm X grassroots movement has done exceptional work to keep uh, the African American prisoners, political prisoners, prisoner of war. In the eyes of activists, we really need to do more around that. Um, I think that the movement uh, around uh, uh, defunding the police clearly has failed, but it wasn't because the movement failed. It just wasn't that movement. The imperialists just simply said, "We're going to wait you out, and you're going to stop talking about this, and we'll just kill it." I think it was something. It was an election in Minneapolis. I want to say Minneapolis or maybe Milwaukee, Wisconsin or Minnesota about that issue and it was defeated. But I don't think that that's a that's an issue that should be just left left to die. But I do think that um, there are some contradictions with the whole campaign of defunding police. Because see, the problem with that with that demand is nothing wrong with the demand, but the police are not going anywhere. They're, they're all just refunded in some other kind of way. 
So I think we need to re review that demand and see what, what's going to happen with it. Because it was raised in the midst of Black Lives Matter movement around George Floyd. So I don't think it's something just to dismiss it. Oh, we just can't do it. Yeah. But look at it again. Um, I do think the um, the issue of, uh, you know, at least within the mass movement, I think supporting anti-imperialist struggles in, in Yemen and Palestine um, and getting a, getting a better sense of how liberation movements internally are going to work together and strike blows against uh, the United States imperialist system. Mm -hmm. There's not much talk about that, but always always some occurring on reservations and in like native control areas around water, around oil, around COVID. These things are going on are going on in a large large measure. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think those are things that we need to kind of keep in mind when we set our set our targets for activism. Mm -hmm. And we also need to focus on recruiting. We need to recruit millions of people. I didn't say thousands, I said millions of people mm -hmm. into this mass movement, into our movement. Yeah. There's no reason yeah. why we don't have millions of people in the streets or as members paying dues, doing things in the same way around the country. I know it starts with tens and then hundreds and then thousands and ten thousand, but I think our goal should be millions. Yeah. If yeah. if not in every state, at least in some states in the country and we need to grow our movement and be disciplined about creating a next a next wave of activism that can last you know until um 2050 2060 2070 you know we, we even have a, a long-term view yeah yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um i would add on to the uh to the tools you know necessary to fight uh, police brutality um uh, three tools one is uh you know, uh, uh, community control over uh, security, so that uh, people know that they can trust you know community uh, security more than they can call the police, and so they won't call the police; they'll call community security in order to avoid any uh, outrages. Right. Secondly, uh, civilian uh, review board. You know, we can elect a civilian review board. You know, municipality can set up a, a civilian board, elected civilian board that reviews um, any complaints against the police instead of the police reviewing complaints against themselves by themselves. And thirdly, uh, oh, there was a, a third one. Uh, uh, I forget it now. <laughs> but uh, uh, I think that there's uh, so much that can be done, you know. Because there's already been uh, various networks set up between peoples who only lack a program in order to mobilize and could exactly. continue to mobilize. Exactly. So, so that's, you know, I think that uh, you've got that program. And I think that I hope that people pay attention. Right. Okay, very good. Okay, so let's uh, broadcast this and uh, we will continue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your advice. <laughs>